challenge on that he was here. He went home to get something and was on his way back. Okay, so I can start with the teachers first if that's okay. And then we'll do the slides. Sure. This here? Mm -hmm. Everyone mind? Oh, he's here, everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
provide the necessary support to ensure a successful start for our students. I personally want to thank both of them for everything they've done this year, and I'm very excited to see what else they bring to our district in the ENL program. So thank you and congratulations. So this is our pre-K. Our pre-K, you we see we have 85 students, five asylum seekers, and there are the classrooms that, that they're in. Uh, we're expecting about 100 pre-K. We have 85, so um, we do have that full day class, which is good for I think, kids and good for us, but um, enrollment is a little lower at this point than we would have expected. Uh, here's kindergarten. Um, kindergarten, we have about 150 students. Um, and eight asylum seekers, and you see where they are. Um, three in Mrs. Kamarowski, three Mr. Kozar, three uh, Mrs. Pieri. And what the elementary principals do for ease of service, ENL service, is they, have, they create um, ENL classrooms in each grade level. And in the primary case, there's three ENL classrooms in each grade level. And you know, out of the 22 students, for example, 10 or 11 might be ENL. So there are a large number of ENL students in, in each of these classrooms, in addition to the three asylum seekers. But again, it just helps with um, delivery of service. Um, second grade, here are our class, class numbers. Um, 162 kids overall in the grade level, eight asylum seekers. And again, three classrooms are spread out in. See, the classrooms are, the, the class numbers are, are generally, you know, good, you know, low, low 20s or, you know, are, I think are numbers that I like to see. Um, in the second grade, it holds true. Uh, we do have a classroom of 25, one with 24, but overall, our class uh, numbers are, um, are as you see here, 159 total, 10 asylum seekers, uh, and they're they're spread out among those um, those three classrooms. Um, at the intermediate school, scroll up to third grade. Uh, these are. Our class sizes, right here. Uh, these are uh, we have four asylum seekers in two classrooms, two and two. Um, fourth grade. Now fourth grade is, is where we had an anomaly, where we had we had uh, an issue over the summer. Um, we here here are the class sizes currently in fourth grade: 27, 26, 26, 26, 26, 26. 26, 26. Those are not acceptable. And what we were doing. Uh, we had 21 students move into the district between the end of school and today that are in fourth grade. That's a whole classroom of fourth grade students that just moved into the district over the summer. Uh, before the, the numbers got to, got this high, we were thinking of, and I, you know, discussing with, with Mrs. Crum and discussing with some of the teachers at the intermediate school, we were thinking of uh, providing teacher aids for the classrooms that were getting higher numbers. And that was what we were you know, that was the plan, but after the plan was enacted, more fourth grade students started to come in. And the numbers got to be uh, what you see here. And at that point, we decided you know, that, that, that those numbers are too high, even with teacher aides. And you know, we didn't want to split up the kids. Um, but I feel like lower class sizes uh, would be more beneficial in the long run. So we are posting for a fourth grade teacher now. And with the, the new fourth grade teacher, these will be our class sizes, which you see are vastly better than these ones. Uh, but again, it was not our first option to, to split up the, the kids. You know, they're placed in classrooms right now, but we just we had no control over the, the, the number of fourth graders that entered into the district over the summer. Just, I've never seen something like that happen you know, all on one grade level. 
we had a high number of first grade students move in too, but not enough to, as you can see with the uh, class sizes here, not enough to, um, you know, make, make a change like we are in fourth grade. But, you know, we want the families to know that wasn't our, you know, our, uh, we know it knowing, first of all, that that many students would move into the district over the summer. And, it, you know, uh, wasn't our first choice to split up the classes either. Uh, yeah, we, we were going to uh, assign teacher aides, but um, these are not classroom numbers that I'm comfortable with. So that's the reason why we're um, adding a fourth grade classroom at this time. And you see, fourth grade only has two asylum seekers as well. So it's not, these aren't, it's not an issue because of asylum seekers. This is an issue of families moving into the district over the summer. Fifth grade, um, they have nine asylum seekers, 180. It's a pretty healthy number for fifth grade. And um, you see the class sizes. They're, they're, you know, a couple of them are getting to levels like that I'm not comfortable with. Um, but, you know, we're going to continue listening to the teachers and see if um, there's anything that they tell us that they need. We're going to attempt to uh, fill those needs. But at this point, this is where we stand at fifth grade. In middle and high school, we uh, we have a, a large number of. You look at our our sixth grade class, which includes twelve asylum seekers. Uh, we weren't we were not expecting 180 students in sixth grade, so we did get a, a lot of. In addition to the asylum seekers, we did get students moving into the district that were sixth graders. Um, middle school is about 500 students right now overall between this, the three grade levels. Now we did provide the middle school with a, a dean of students and a hall monitor to help, um, you know, with the environment in the school. Um, we didn't know at the time that you know we had asylum seekers and such, but we uh, we did it because we wanted to be proactive, <coughs> help teachers help in the environment. But those numbers are big. Uh, a number that sticks out of high school is the freshman class of 183. Again. You know, we have five asylum seekers there, but we had a lot of students moving in that were freshmen. And that number is, is, is very high. Um, and so the high school overall is 641 students, 14 <coughs> asylum seekers. Um, at this point, where we are with the asylum seekers, um, the ENL, the state of New York gave the ENL department um, extra time to conduct the initial screenings to determine the, the, the levels that the students are which determines their level of service. If they're beginning, they get more uh, ENL service than, than if they're more advanced. Um, so we're in the process of you know, making that, uh, uh, those determinations through the testing. We have reached out to um, BOCES to see if we can get assistance in helping our teachers conduct this testing so that we can start to deliver service. Because once we start to deliver the service, then we can figure out where, really, where are the needs. Do we need more? Aids? Do we need you know lower class sizes somewhere? We we just don't have that information. This is at the start of the second full week of school, I believe, right? So we're actively working on getting that information. But right now it's it's a hectic time for teachers trying to test these kids, uh, all the ENL kids, to, to get them um, you know uh, appropriate levels for for uh, uh, service delivery. Um, we're continuing, I have weekly conversations with a working group, a micro working group that includes the Bosey superintendent, Superintendent Sweet Home, um, the representatives of Jericho Road, with the organization helping the asylum seekers, and, uh, and the county. And we talk, we talk about issues you know, related to the region, and um, that's been very helpful. There's been very good collaboration between Yuri One Bosey's and, and us. Um, I met with some um, OC staff today about the pos possibility of bringing in itinerant teachers if we need that service rather than teacher aides. Um, and we're continuing to listen to our teachers. I'm meeting with um, some uh, building representatives tomorrow and uh, I'm going to hear what they have to say about what they're thinking they need. Um, so it's been a very fluid situation, um, you know, it's been a very hectic month. Um, Asylum Seekers started to register, I think, the, 20th, the 25th of August. So since then, uh, it's been very um, you know, fluid, very changing, a lot of information changing. Um, you don't know a lot of information either, um, but we try to give as much as we can in, in time for the kids. Um, 
I think the kids are adjusting well. I think you know, their principals report they're very, very uh, vivacious. Very, <laughs> um, very happy to be here. We're happy to have them too. Um, again, I've always said this is not an issue that they've caused. And uh, I view our role as, a, as an educational institution is to make this the best possible place that we can for those kids. And, and uh, that's what our teachers and, and staff are doing. Um, so it's been a, a good start. Um, I think that we'll have more of an idea of the resources that we need, if any, as uh, the situation develops. But right now, um, hiring the, the extra .5 teacher, hiring potentially four to six teacher aides, and the transportation costs associated with asylum seekers were over $400,000. So this is, again, $400,000 that we were not intending to spend when we passed the district budget in May. So, I mean, I'm doing a lot of questioning about how is the district going to get reimbursed for this? Who is going to reimburse us? I'd be happy to hand someone a bill, uh, whoever that may be. Um, but, uh, again, you know, the district, the taxpayers of the district, current students, uh, we're not, we didn't ask for um, this political situation either. And, and again, there's, to me, for me, it's, it's a, it's, there's, it's a multifaceted issue, right? It's we take care of the kids because that's what we do. We take care of kids. There's no question about it. On the other hand, we have we're responsible for the taxpayers, so we need to make sure that we protect both of those groups, and um, that's what we're attempting to do. We're actively lobbying the state, um, New York City, as much as they'll listen to us about uh, reimbursing us for our costs. So it's a lot. It's been a lot of a uh, lot of work. A lot of. Uh, you know, things that we haven't done before, hopefully we don't do it again, just like the, the COVID years. I remember the COVID years, the same thing, you know, same thing. Um, we did we did the work, we didn't have a lot of information, information that we had changed all the time. And uh, when it ended, we never wanted to see again. So this kind of reminds me of that, but uh, there is a sweet thing about it, and it's the kids. The kids that, that we welcomed into our district are, uh, I think, any, any, any diversity enriches us. And, uh, we're, we're glad to have them. So, uh, anybody have any questions about the asylum seekers? I'll continue to keep the board and the community updated on, on things as I know them. Let's just know that we're, we're working very hard behind the scenes to try to recoup some of this money and uh, do whatever we can for the, for the district. The second issue I, I wanted to kind of talk about before the reports. Um, was the issue of the CDA, the Child Victims Act. And there was an article that came out in Buffalo News um, a few weeks ago, and there was actually a story on Channel 7 today about it. Um, the, the, the CDA, the Child Victims Act, was, in case you don't know, was passed by New York State. It allowed um, victims of child abuse to uh, a greater window to go back and sue um, an organization, an individual, for child abuse that occurred. Well, Maryvale was named in five cases from the 1970s, the early 1970s, so more than 50 years ago. And we, as a result of those cases, we owe millions of dollars uh, that, that we need to pay. So the, the Child Victims Act, although you could argue it was well intended, there are real consequences for us as a district, as taxpayers. Most of us weren't even born you know, when, when these uh, things happen. And the individual that perpetrated these things is deceased. So now the law says that the current taxpayers are on the hook to pay for these judgments. They could have been in the tens of millions of dollars each, um, but they're still, it's still substantial. It's still something that we're going to be talking about as a board. <coughs> and we're going to need to talk to the community about how do we, how do we get through this? because we have to pay roughly $1.2 million a year for the next five years as a result of the CBA. And that's a significant hit on our budget. Um, so it, it, it is something that we're also lobbying the state for because the state created this issue. They created this law and then they, I don't think, thought through the consequences of enough on what could happen to kids who have their programs. Uh, Assemblyman Comrade, uh, Assemblymember Wallace, or 
two co-sponsors of the bill, and uh, Mr. Conrad spoke today about the options on the table are, you know, could be cuts to programs. And if you've been to our budget presentations, you know that the majority of our budget is spent on programs, and, and that's the way it should be. So when you're looking at budget reductions, that's where, unfortunately, the budget reductions happen. The non-mandated things, the things that we built back up after the recession. The recession era, we had nothing in this district. And we built back up. Uh, we, there's still a long way to go. Um, but we don't want to lose what we've had, uh, what we brought back. <clears throat> so the board and I, we're, we're fighting for this funding. We're fighting uh, to be made whole, or at least some of it. Uh, because I don't think that the taxpayers and the kids of today should be on hook for what happened over 50 years ago. It's not fair. Um, so we're fighting for it. Uh, but it's something that we're going to be talking about, especially as we get closer to budget season, we're be talking about it in public and presenting what we think are the options um, to the community. And ultimately, it's the board and the community <coughs> that decides the direction that we go. Our job is just to present it. And we're going to be doing that over the next several months. Anything else I should add? No. Questions about the CDA? All right. Rambled on about that thing, right? So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now on to our fun stuff. Our uh, first presentation is the audit report. I was going to say, I want to see the audit. <laughs>
And the intention and plan, I believe, is for the board to review that and to use that as necessary during the 24 school year and or determine what reserves it should be added to. Note six, short-term debt. Um, so short-term debt is typically bond anticipation notes. As of year end, you did not have any bond anticipation notes, but subsequent to year end, and therefore disclosed in your statements, was issuance of a $24.8 million bond anticipation note, 19.7 of that being used for your ongoing capital projects, and then the 5.1 million towards the legal settlements that the superintendent discussed, um, and that is that $1.2 million payment, repayment over five years. <clears throat> Note seven is your long-term liabilities, your leases, your bonds, your energy performance contract. Note eight, excuse me, is pensions, and note nine is other post-employment benefits. All adjustments that we recommended were made as part of the audit. We had no disagreements with management. Um, the one remaining open item is just getting a legal letter back from your attorney, which is typically the last thing that we ask for as we present. And there were no other significant matters or findings. <clears throat> the management letter is where we would convey to you any material weaknesses that we found in your internal controls. There were no material weaknesses in your internal controls, so our comments within the management letter are basically just observations and comments and recommendations. Uh, the first one, again, relates to the 4% of the amount of unsigned fund balance in excess of the 4%. The second point is relative to your extra classroom activity clubs. Uh, the student treasurers keep a set of records in addition to the central treasurer's records. Those should match. Uh, there was one club that we tested that didn't match, and then there were a few clubs that just had missing receipts and disbursements details, so we just recommend um, that those are the treasurers that you review with them and the faculty advisors review with them to ensure that those records are complete. And then fund balance in the food service fund shouldn't exceed uh, the average of three months of expenditures within your school lunch fund. Because of COVID funding, almost every district has fund balance in excess of that number. And this is really just a reminder and a recommendation to continue reviewing uh, your school food service fund to determine what that excess fund balance can be used for. There are only specific things that you can use that money for, and you have to submit a plan as you have done, and we'll have to do again to the state education department. Then there's two new accounting pronouncements coming out in 2024 and 2025. We do not expect either of them to have a significant impact on the district. Um, but we have <coughs> summarized them within that letter for your review. Moving on to the next page, it's just a summary of fund balance. The general fund is broken out between your reserves, your amounts designated for the subsequent year, encumbrances, and unassigned fund balance. We have an increase of about $2.8 million in fund balance in the general fund due to increases in state aid, which I'll review momentarily. In the capital projects fund was a significant change from a deficit of 11.2 million to positive fund balance of 2.3 million. That is just an accounting function. You had bond anticipation notes in 2022 that you then issued bonds to repay during 2023. Those bonds are recognized as revenue and they offset that deficit. At the end of the day, total fund balance then for the district increased from 6.5 million to 22.9 million again as a function of those bonds that fund balance will go back down as you spend on your projects the next two pages just show detail of your general fund revenue and general fund expenditures you can see from the charts that for the most part um, your, those remain relatively consistent year to year extremely consistent for the most part the, the only one you can see increasing of any significance is state aid. Um, your increases for 2023 were due to increases in general aid, and then about $1.3 million in increase in transportation aid. That is best based on the prior year expenditures. As you'll recall, transportation costs were close to zero during COVID and then going up slightly. So each year, as you get a year further and you're having more transportation costs the year before, they're being reimbursed. <coughs> So it's because of 2022 expenditures we've received additional transportation aid in 23. General fund expenditures were up about $3.8 million or 8.1%. Really the big change here is in that transportation and other expenses. On a fund basis, um, you did pay about $2 million 
in settlements on those uh, CBA claims during the 2023 school year. And then the balance of that was financed with the bond anticipation note in July. So you do see an increase in expense of $2 million because of that in 2023. Without that legal settlement, your increase was only about 3.9% in expenses year to year. With that $2 million, your increase was 8.1%. The final page is the government-wide summary. So as a government, you are required to show your activity both on, both on a fund or modified accrual basis and on a government-wide or full accrual basis of accounting. So this government-wide method includes all of the activity of the district, including all of your buildings and equipment, net of depreciation, and then all of your long-term liabilities as debt. This schedule just summarizes all of those. Really, the only big fluctuations year to year is the flip-flopping of the increase in your long-term liabilities and the decrease in your other liabilities, and that is due to the issuance of that bond that repaid a ban. A ban is short-term, included in other. A bond is long-term, included in long-term liabilities. Um, also included on this basis in other liabilities is the additional $4.4 million for the legal settlement as well, which again will be recognized on a fund basis uh, starting in 24. That is as brief a summary as I can do. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>
The green is showing the growth in our subgroup populations, where we show that um, we increased our growth of our students coming into Maryvale. Um, and you will see that I highlight on the next slide our current um, ENL or English language learner student data. I think that's important to show. This is not part of. This should say that this is not part of the state report card for 21-22. But I wanted to put this fresh new slide up here so you can see our growth in our, our English language learner population, as that's one of the indicators that has shifted um, in the New York State report card. You'll see on the next several slides. It'll, it'll look at ELP and ELP um, where we fall within the growth model for that. So you can see in 13-14, uh, we had 52 uh, Ls, and uh, currently we have 216 with that number for this year. 23-24 is about, I believe, we're almost at 280-ish. So that's definitely a 315% increase last year. It was up until last year. Now we have even more growth there. So we're almost at 10% with our Ls. Uh, which is great for diversity. Uh, we started at you know a little under two or a little over two percent um, at 13, 14, and we've really grown um, in this in this subgroup of students. So the great news to celebrate is that our, our intermediate school was um, showed enough growth in their subgroup. So I'll show you that slide in a little bit um, that they're no longer identified, and so neither is our school district. Um, and that that's not just easy to say that they're no longer identified. I have to give. Uh, kudos to the instructional leader at the building, Eileen Clark, and the teaching staff, the remarkable work that they did to, to get where they needed to go to show that growth. And we're so excited to see that continued growth. Um, can't talk about the data that's been released, but I can tell you I took a peek at it, and I'm really excited because I can see that we have even more growth to celebrate. So that's really exciting because then you can see the results trickling into the middle school, which is awesome as well because over time, for five years, they've been working on and we're always working on school improvement um, cycle, but they really uh, dove deep into their data, they embraced it, they targeted what they needed to target, and they continue to do that to sustain that growth. So uh, again, you can't give enough props to that because that's a big achievement. Um, probably deserves more than just this one slide. Um, <laughs> probably deserves a party. Um, so when we look at indicator accountability levels, I want you to keep focus on this one, two, three, four. Uh, one is zero to ten percent of the schools in New York State. That's where we fall in that indicator. Two is ten to fifty percent of the schools in New York State. Three is fifty-one to seventy-five percent, and then seventy-five percent or higher is four, so it's exceeding. Um, in that that huge range of two, you look at ten to fifty percent of the schools fall within there. They do not give us a percentage ranking, so we don't have the percentages. We just have the we just have the overall ranking of where we fall. So we won't we never receive a, a target or an exact percentage within that 10 to 50 where we fall. So here are here um, are the different indicators and, and subgroups here that we're looking at for the elementary middle. Elementary middle is first grade through eighth grade. So this slide is a picture of first through eighth grade. Um, and what again what we want to see is we really we'd love to see fours because four is always exceeding um, but we want to really look for those threes and then those twos. Um, twos are really showing that developing and kind of growing into the next category and the next ranking. We always want to be ranked pretty high up, right? So we want to try to stride through that four, but three also is, is good to be at as well. You can see that they took, um, the, now the state weighs uh, attendance ranking in here. So chronic absenteeism is that last column there. Um, it is very interesting to look at our chronic absenteeism ranking um, and where we fall, because again, um, we want to fall within that. That three is 51 to 75 percent of the schools in New York State compared to our student performance. The first column is core subject performance, and that is all the students that took the test, the New York State assessments. Uh, the second column speaks to that 95 percent. So our goal. Uh, New York State, uh, I said, has an expectation that we need 95% of our students being tested. Um, that's something I can say that both schools have been focused on for the last several, several, many years. Um, and making sure our students get tested, 95% of our students get tested. That's been always around for the last 20 plus years that I've known New York State um, and their testing is always to try to target that 95%. The second column includes that 95%. So you can see a three, it's a little bit higher because um, once we get into individual schools, you'll see that the middle school met that 95% at a bit of a higher rate than the intermediate school did. So you'll see that th those numbers change a little bit. Um, 
All right, I'm going to move to the next here. The secondary indica indicator levels, this is our high school 9 through 12, also inclusive of our middle school students that take algebra and living environments. This data looks a little different, will look a little different than it will this year because this data considers all of our waivers, right? So the waivers that were in place for our regents exams and um, so it will take that column one and two might look a little bit a little bit different um, this year than it has in the past. That graduation rate stands out, I would think, at, at that two. So again, we're at that two, which is 10, where if we fall um, with, in a ranking with the New York State, all the New York State schools, 10 to 50 percent. We don't know that percentage that we're in that number two. But I can tell you that they consider the cohort. So the four-year cohort, the five-year cohort, and the six-year cohort graduation rate. So our six-year cohort for, um, I think it was 2015-2016, we were at about a 90% um, graduation rate. The five-year cohort was at about a 90% as well, and then the four-year was at a 92%. Within those individual cohorts, though, they consider and weight the dropout, um, the non-graduates. Okay, so in the 15-16 cohort, there were 17 non-graduate non-graduates. In the um, 16 five-year cohort, it was 18, and then 12 in the four-year cohort. So that also weights into it. Um, and then if it puts it in perspective that if, if it's a 90, it's about a 90% graduation rate that this indicator number two, it's giving us a number two, that means in New York State then, so are other 10 to 50% of the schools also fall into that. So it's not like, I don't want that two to like, Break this out a little bit because 10 to 50 percent of the schools in New York State also are in that category as well, and a lot of it had to do with the waivers um, for the for the COVID for the school year. So students didn't have to take the exam um, that impacts it as well. And then this is the primary school accountability data, and when we're looking at this data, columns one and two are specific to grade three students and how they do on the state state test. Um, so again, you'll look at the left hand, the, the first column here um, explains all the students that took the assessment. The second is that denominator of 95%. Then we look at our um, ELP, and so this is our English language proficiency. Um, and the state sets uh, for each building based on where students are on their levels and how long they've been identified as an English language learner, the state sets a, an expected growth target. So I just pulled the growth targets for this to explain that, that column a little bit better. So for the primary school, the growth, the state growth target was a 0.34, um, and we, uh, we met it at a 0.19. So that would put us into that progress, that's our growth progress made, and gives us a level two. A level four, again, is exceeding that target. In order to get a level three, you have to meet the target that the state set, sets 100%. So, that's why you will not see probably a three. You have to meet it at 100%, which, I mean, it's high expectations are good, but we've also had COVID in with us too. Um, and then uh, the chronic absenteeism, that is our, that only is considered our first and second graders because kindergarten, pre-K, and kindergarten data is not taken into account for the New York State accountability data. When we look at the intermediate building, um, when we look at when the intermediate building was identified, or any building were to get identified, how the, how the accountability data is looked at, the state looks at column one and column two. And if there's a, if there's a level one in either of those columns, um, then we move on to the third column. If there's a level one in the third column, that's how we become identified as a targeted school within a school district. So these numbers are pretty important as they're calculating and weighing um, the, uh, the performance for each uh, building and for the students. Again, we look at our, our ELP proficiency here, and there's, again, a target that's set um, by the state was 0.35, and then the amount of growth our students shown was 0.31. So we're just a, that's a, few, just a few points shy from uh, meeting that 100%, which would put us in that three category. So that's why you see level two there. And then you can see the growth broken down by subgroups. It is interesting to see when you look at if, if you look at threes and fours and chronic absenteeism, those are students that are coming to school all the time. And then you look at their performance um, and their weighted average performance um, or their core subject performance. That's good data to look at to determine, like, hmm, I wonder what's, if there's a little discrepancy here or what's going on with this data. If the students are showing up to school, but, we're, but the, if they're showing up all the time and they have great attendance, their performance might be, might be lacking in another area. Look at that. It helps us dig a little bit deeper. 
Um, okay, and then middle school accountability data, and as I had said earlier, you'll see like in that weighted average uh, participation or performance is really a tribute to the participation rate at the middle school. They exceeded that 95%, um, and so you can see that reflected there in that level three for most of their students. Um, and their, um, again, their level two and their English language proficiency, um, their target was set at a 0.29, and they, the success, uh, the growth progress made was 0.26. So you see, they're just shy, just 0.29 to 0.26, so that's a level. That, that would put them at a level two, but very close to a level three. And then we have the, oops, the high school data here. Um, and here you will see that, that graduation rate, again, that was in the slide before. Um, and for their English proficiency level, they had a target set for 0.27. And their growth made was a 0.03. So that put them at that, that level one. And again, these calculations are figured on how long the students have been identified as an English language learner, what their current levels are, and how much growth they show. So, if a student is at expanding, like the growth is going to be minimal compared to a student that's maybe at a beginning level of the inner era, the primary building just coming to us, they're going to show that growth faster. So keep that in consideration too. But these are just these are just indicators that help us work on the work, right? Work on the instruction, work on what we need to do to target um, all students to make sure we're meeting the needs of all students. And, and that is really what New York State um, is about with this new accountability data that's not, it's about six years new, but they really want to make sure that school districts are transparent with their data and they're targeting the, the subgroups um, that they need to target to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all learners. And it's a good thing, because before it was just based on, if you remember, how many kids got three or four in the ELA math, and then that was your, that was your proficiency rate, and that's how you were really kind of labeled as, as uh, school district, right? So if they take into that growth, that growth piece, even the little bit of growth that's shown counts towards that progress. Okay, what questions do you have? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, Ms. Phillips, for the summer school program highlights. this year increased drastically. Um, last year we had, uh, the year before last, we had 37 students in middle school and this year we had 46, uh, 46 students. So our numbers went up and the high school, the high school we had 46 uh, students um, this year as opposed to, um, I'm sorry, we had 51 students uh, this past summer, the summer before we had 40. So our total pulled together, um, we went up 20 students. And the way, um, the, this year we were fortunate enough to have a lot of live classes, so we were able to get uh, teachers. Um, unfortunately, um, for Mac in grades six and seven, I was unable to uh, secure a teacher, so we used Apex. And the high school, um, you want to yeah, we used um, APEX. Uh, we went from grad point to our new program of um, APEX. 
and for that we use it for geometry, English 12, and for art history. We had um, in the middle school, um, all the students passed. We had um, no failures, so uh, that was good this year. <laughs> and uh, for the high school, um, we just had uh, we had very few, very few failures. Mostly, um, all of our students passed the classes. Uh, so this year, um, with the special appeal, um, they um, here are the numbers presented for the students who passed Regents exams. We also had five August graduates this year. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Is APEX just an online? Like, yeah, it's kind of like GradPoint, but what we used to use, which was GradPoint, but it is an online program. Yeah, thank you for your work. Um, we should note that the summer program, uh, this is the last year for the summer program in, in, in its current form. Uh, we paid for the summer program, summer school via with the stimulus funds. And uh, we're probably going to go back to how it was run in the past uh, versus this model, but we'll discuss that as we get closer to the summer. But that's a possibility. So, great job. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I don't need any technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're good, Joe. Uh, just, you, you should have this in your packet. Uh, we had uh, a June's nice students who didn't get through. Um, five of them, as Mrs. Hunter said, did graduate uh, in August. Um, two of them, uh, two of them are coming back for no, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, two of them are coming back for a fifth year. One student is currently just needs to pass English regions to get uh, their diploma. So that student's back in the academic intervention, uh, and perhaps they'll hopefully pass it in January. And then one student has exited out for the to go into the test, which is the the new, um, which is the, the new, the new. Any questions? Comments? Pretty straightforward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Principals, are, do you have a report? All right, so just in case you wanted more numbers, you got them. We're not sick of them yet. So every year we do have to do uh, the beta report. Uh, it's based on school safety, and there's certain um, incidents that need to be reported. Uh, as we'll kind of get into here. The second part of this is also the Dignity for All Students Act uh, and reporting, reporting a sense of harassment and bullying. So again, a lot of this is governed by uh, federal and state laws. Uh, we do this annually. Um, and fortunately, you know, we've never really had too much of an issue with our numbers in, in our These are the uh, 10 categories that we have to uh, report on. Um, hopefully we never get into some of these categories. Uh, you know, it goes all the way from homicide to sexual, various sexual offenses. You'll see that, that there's kind of two levels of those sexual offenses. Um, same thing with assaults and weapons possession. Um, then we get into the harassment and the bullying, the discrimination, um, bomb threats, false alarms so on and so forth. And each category is weighted with a different weight and we'll kind of go into where those weightings come in. 
Um, the, the weightings come in when, when we talk about the school violent index or this indicator. And basically what we're doing is we're adding up all the points based on those incidents and uh, dividing by our student population. And that kind of gives us this, indicate, this uh, index. And as long as uh, we stay below 1.5, we're good. Uh, primary school, you want to start? Sure. During the 22-23 school year, we did have one incident uh, that did occur on school grounds. Um, and so we, we had to do a beta report. Um, and I had to ask for help in how to do that because we had that since I was in here. So. Uh, we're continuing to support our student programs and our students uh, through our, the use of our school counselor. Um, our CARES program is again meeting once per 30 weeks. We have Miss Mary that comes and does fabulous lessons with our kids and everyone is really enjoying it. It goes very nicely cohesively in our current PBIS program that we're continuing. Uh, PAUSE is part of that. Positive actions in a winning spirit. Uh, our CARES education program is continued on. We're continuing with the second step in our social emotional curriculum. That's pre-K all the way through second. Um, we are continuing with restorative circles, um, our hub program, hello, update, goodbye, check-ins, where we have kids who need a little extra something, something, and they check in with a person that's kind of their cheerleader and making sure that they're staying on track, so that's been very successful. Um, we do have a BOCES behavior specialist that comes throughout the year and works with our teachers as needed, and we're continuing with our Western year. Western New York United program, too good for violence programs. So kids do receive a 10 week, um, once a week uh, scenario, uh, learning about that. So we're continuing on with all of those things. Um, and so this is the weighted with the other sex conduct. Um, and we are well within our range. school had eight incidences. We had seven. Oops. There was um, on school grounds one that was on the bus. Here's our ratings. Um, because we had three of them that were other sex conduct. We had the um, bullying harassment. It was non-cyber bullying. We had a false alarm and we had 11 but we're at 0.28, so it is below the 1.5 benchmark. Supports that we have in place are things that we've been doing, but each year we try to um, strengthen them or add other things, and that's what we're doing. So we're continuing with our PBIS system, and we're currently in the process of revamping our MTSS system with our child support team. We're um, sort of rebranding it, it's gonna be um, instead of child support, it's going to be student support, and we're coming up with more frequent meetings, more data collection to look at um, students that are having difficulty either with behavior or academics. We are still doing our shout outs. We have individual counseling. We have group counseling that we do. Um, as part of PBIS, we have check in, check out, which students that we feel need another layer of support get a mentor. And they check in with that mentor in the morning and they check in, in at the end of the day. But they have goals that they are trying to reach throughout the day and that's what they discuss with their mentor. Um, we have our social worker who's continuing to work with our students and a full-time counselor that was hired. This year I put in yellow sort of the new things that we're looking at doing, but whatever is in white is what we've been doing and are going to continue. So we have a Dean of Students this year, which is, I think is going to make a huge impact um, on being able to connect with even more students on a daily basis. We are creating a restorative justice team, and we're working with a restorative justice coalition this year, so we're getting trained. And we're going to start doing more um, restorative circles when students re-enter the classroom. So not just suspensions, it could be in-school suspensions, but it could be lunch detentions or just short removals from class. But getting our staff trained on what that restorative conference looks like to re-enter the child back in. Um, Big Brothers Big Sisters, we work with the Western New York United program also, Too Good for Violence. 
We have our school counselor who pushes in the second step. Our school psychologist does that. Our school counselor pushes in with SEL lessons. And we embedded over the summer, we did some curriculum work where we took our ELA maps and we embedded some diversity, equity, and inclusivity into those maps so that we're teaching those principles and foundations, not just as standalone lessons, but they're being integrated into our curriculum as well. And then our morning meetings, which we've always done, but now what we added this year into the master schedule is a community checkout. So teachers are checking out with students at the end of the day as well. It's only five minutes because that's all we had, but it's better than not being able to check in with your students and then things fester overnight and then you don't know what happened. So now it's a quick check-in at the end of the day so they can get a pulse on where kids are and if they need to make a phone call home or if they need to reach out to one of the counselors to say, hey, could you talk to the student first thing tomorrow morning, we're able to address it quicker, the needs of our students quicker. We have the backpack program through the Western um, New York Food Bank, our more program that the district has. We have student ambassadors at every grade to help new students transition into the building in their classroom so they greet the new students that are registering in. And our school improvement goals are based on diversity, equity, and inclusivity framework. That's what our um, building goals are based on. So as you go up to grade levels, you get more incidents. <laughs> <laughs> um, 13 incidents, you can see nine offenders. So you know, some of these incidents do involve multiple students. Um, uh, there were seven incidents that were discriminatory in nature, and that comes down to our the bullying and harassment uh, issues that, that we have had this year. Uh, as you can see, uh, most of the points that we have coming from are, are from two sexual offenses. Just so you know, um, something like pantsing is considered a sexual offense. Okay, so uh, there are two different categories in sexual offenses. Some, one, the major offenses are, are typically more violent, um, where the other sexual offenses would be more of your, what I would consider more of a sexual harassment type uh, level. Uh, you'll see a lot of the same programs that the primary and intermediate school have talked about, you know, we carry on in the uh, middle school. Some of it is just because they're, they're more of a district-wide type program or a K-8 program. Some of it, quite honestly, is we saw the school improvement process that um, uh, Mrs. Crum went through in the intermediate school and how successful some of those programs were, and we saw them. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you a <laughs> um, The leaders in training is part of Western New York United, so they do come into our sixth grade class and also do a 10 week unit. Uh, but then as those sixth graders move into seventh and eighth grade, there's cohorts of roughly a dozen students that uh, become these leaders in training. They do a full summer program. Uh, with Western New York United and they come back and bring those skills in, into our building. They run our whole Red Ribbon Assembly uh, that we do in October as well. Um, Project CARE uh, is relatively new to us. Uh, this is our second year going into it and they really try to teach students about um, reading emotions and expressing emotions. It also hits on a lot of our ELA standards as well. And they push into one academic class for each grade level um, a week. So we kind of spread that around. So no class loses more than uh, four days a year of instruction, but yet the kids are getting this service uh, at least once a week throughout the entire year. We are continuing with uh, PBIS. Uh, we work with face-to-face. -face. Uh, again, bigger kids sometimes have bigger problems. So as we find students who maybe have some kind of dependency issue, uh, we do refer them to face-to-face -to -face and have that partnership. Um, our social workers have been absolutely phenomenal in building relationships with Compeer and mental health associates. Uh, they have uh, interns coming in who actually run small groups and one-to-one -one counseling with a lot of our students. So it just adds as another resource and another or, uh, outlet for our students to uh, share with. We also uh, were able to get thank you to all of you for uh, allowing us to have a dean of students and a hall monitor this year. Um, Cheryl Liska is our hall monitor and she's getting 23,000 steps a day. Um, so 
she, she's definitely out and about, and uh, it, we are definitely noticing less students in the, the bathrooms, even during passing time, uh, less students being late to school and late to class already. Just in the first two or three weeks, we have noticed a significant difference. And our Dean of Students, Dale Stryker, has really taken a, a proactive approach. So he's not really looking so much at discipline you know, after it already happened. He's looking at those students who are at risk and running small groups with them during, during lunch. And he actually developed um, with Kelly Cook Fair a five-week program that students enter into as they're struggling. And he's working on skill building and ways to deal with uh, their complex emotions and their outbursts in a more constructive manner so that hopefully it doesn't lead to disciplinary referrals and we don't get, even right, get to that level um, where Mrs. Phillips or I would have to get involved. And then our uh, school counselors are running groups as needed. So it kind of depends on uh, what we have going on. There's some years where we just have a lot of changing families. Um, unfortunately, that happens way too often. So that is usually one of our groups. Uh, sometimes we'll have a group of students that are struggling with anger management, and they'll go under that, uh, run a group for that. Uh, so those those groups have really helped because it allows students to realize that they're not alone in their struggles every day. Uh, high school also had 13 uh, incidents as well. Uh, we had one weapons possession. Uh, it's listed as an other because we found another. It wasn't through a normal scanning device that they would come in through. So you get data for more of that. Uh, we do have seven instances of bullying, one instance of cyberbullying, and we did have one bomb threat. Um, and as you see at the bottom, even though it's not scored, we did have three situations of um, drugs possession, mostly THC main patents, um, which was interesting. Um, that brings us well below the, the average, and I'm not going to go through all this, but um, as you see, I think you know that high school is a very robust um, programming for the students. Um, if you are, want to get involved, you have an opportunity to get in the ball, uh, try and get students more and more involved is always key. We are up in our athletic program as far as um, students participating, which is great. Uh, we are up on yearbooks, um, which had three, usually three or four people, 22 students showed up the other day for a yearbook to try to be involved in it. All excellent, very good things. Um, you know, we do have our second year of our freshman mentor program, which its intent is to basically have our upper you know, classmen uh, mentor uh, freshmen and incoming freshmen and basically I'd say show them the way, show them the way, show them the way how you know. Um, you know I always say that our school is only as good as our students to be honest with you. Our student and you know, leaders and our, our upperclassmen have to show the freshmen how, um, how we conduct ourselves and so far um, this group of mentors this year have uh, really stepped up and they've been great. Um, you know, they've been very more vocal with me about their their struggles and trying to connect with the freshmen and stuff like that which is great and they're thinking through and trying to um, our school resource officer is an excellent resource. Um, our social worker, Mrs. Cook Fair, um, you know, does you know miracles. Our counselors, our assistant principal, uh, Mr. Klimzak, uh, all of our teachers, um, you know, they work pretty hard. Um, you know, and we, and we do on uh, to try to build relationships and give our students a rich environment uh, that is uh, conducive to learning and opportunistic for all of our students. So we are planning on going to Cleveland and Pittsburgh on this little tour that we have. Um, so we would leave on the morning of Thursday, January 11th, um, and we would be in Cleveland on Friday, January 12th, um, and then 
we would be in Pittsburgh on Saturday, January 13th. So the cost of each student is around $499 um, with a cap of 51 students and four chaperones. If we get enough student interest, we will increase that cap um, to invest in a second bus. Um, students will ride on a coach charter bus, and the purpose of the trip is to further our students' musical knowledge and experiences with a variety of activities that they would not otherwise be able to have in Western New York. So on Thursday, we're planning on departing um, for Cleveland at around 8 a.m., I think you were thinking. Um, meals, rest, rest stops will be coordinated between chaperones and the bus driver. Um, right when we get there, we're going to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is a really, really cool museum. It has a lot of interesting exhibits, not only related to rock music, but pop, uh, all that good stuff. Um, after that, we will go to the hotel to check in. Um, we go to downtown Cleveland for dinner, and then uh, we're going to see an, a performance of Mrs. Doubtfire, um, which is a musical now, which is really fun. Um, it's actually coming to Shades like this week, if you want to see it. <laughs> um, on Friday, um, we would have breakfast at the hotel, and then we kind of do a non-musical activity, which is just the Cleveland Aquarium, because it's a really awesome facility. Um, after that, we would have lunch, and then um, we, we would depart for our next stop in Pittsburgh. And the reason we're going to Pittsburgh um, is because this is a combined chorus and orchestra trip, so the Mrs. Doubtfire production is kind of aimed more for chorus students, and then the um, orchestra in Pittsburgh is playing pictures of an exhibition, which is a super, super awesome symphony. Um, and none of the like orchestras in the Cleveland area were playing anything of interest at this time. So we're just going to make a quick pit stop in Pittsburgh for that. Um, and then on Saturday, we would have breakfast at the hotel. And then we would check out and depart for a tour of the Carnegie Mellon University, um, which has an incredible school of music. It's very historic. Lots of um, famous music musicians attended this school, um, and this gives kids a chance to see what universities um, have to offer outside of Western New York, even if they're not going for music or musical theater. Um, and then we would arrive back later in Saturday afternoon. Um, so just the highlights, we'd be going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, we would be going to the House of Blues restaurant for dinner, um, after that we would go to see Mrs. Doubtfire at the Playhouse Square, which is Cleveland's version of Shays, pretty much. Um, then on Saturday, like I said, Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, um, which is an incredible, incredible orchestra. Um, and then we would visit Carnegie Mellon. Um, that's our plan. Our backup, if we don't visit Carnegie Mellon, is to visit Fredonia on the way back, um, which, you know, I have a ton of kids applying to Fredonia this year for music specifically, so that would enrich them, as well as students who are looking to go there, because I know that is a very accessible school that many kids choose to pursue after high school. Um, and then our one non-music activity would be the Greater Cleveland Aquarium. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm excited. Any questions? Sounds great. No, the, during the January, not to say that Cleveland's going to make the playoffs, but have you like taken account of like maybe like the prices yeah. of the hotels could go up? So um, it's kind of tricky because normally around uh, music trips happen in the springtime. Um, <laughs> Springtime for the music department is a very busy season um, because we have the musical in March, we have all the all counties in March, which we have increased student attendance in, which is like awesome, but that kind of prevents us from going to a trip during that time. Um, and then Adam Smith is planning his high school trip um, during April, so we didn't want to interfere with that. Um, and this is our first year doing a trip because the last time they planned for um, an out-of-state trip was before COVID. I wasn't here. Um, but this is something that we want to kind of implement regularly into the music program because, you know, kids really create those core memories. I mean, these trips are one of my favorite memories from high school. Um, so January is just how it worked out this year. Uh, but in the future, we think we want to aim for more like April time, if we can coordinate that with Adam Smith. And I would just say they are used to travel along the same rate, and so far we have been, it has been greatly great. He pivots pretty quickly. I mean, when we, were, when we were at COVID, he had lots of different scenarios, and this could happen, that could happen. Um, he even pivots like a week or two beforehand. Um, so I feel like if they did it on their own, I'd be like, yeah, I'm a little nervous, but with travel logs, they're pretty much, they're the experts, and they've been ready for so far. So uh, I think we do. I think we're talking about the Browns. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm going to start with the
very impressive at times. It's touching everybody, including utility companies. They can't get their hands on parts and pieces. And it's you know just something that we want to plan for. So just trying to do some forward thinking here and you know figuring out what the best options are, you know, for the district and obviously this construction project for phase two. Joe, do you worry that the SCP process could change this product? No. Or will the item at the time of bid just the way this particular item is, would it be exactly what it is today? Yes, yeah, there will be no questions in regard to the product that needs to be installed. It's it's a matter of um, the system that's currently in place, uh, it doesn't have any fail safes so that ultimately when you shut one off, they all shut off because they pass through each other. What the new design is doing is allowing isolation between the different substations. So each one would have its own disconnect, so then there would be certain parts of the building that could be shut off independently. Very similar to the normal electric panel, which is on a much larger scale, is kind of what we're dealing with here. So um, no, no. So the design is, is complete. I mean, it's done their design. Um, you know, code compliant. Ultimately, that's their responsibility as a designer to make sure things are code compliant with the New York State. Um, but no, I don't foresee any of those items. Would us getting this through the co-op ahead of the approval risk anything with funding or? Uh, I suppose that could be a possibility. And part of the reason we wanted to discuss it here tonight with you guys, just because it is so unique. Uh, our conversation, though, has been in regards to lead time being what it is. If it was pre-ordered with arrangements through that particular vendor, they would know you know, payment for this, receipt of this, won't occur until after SED's approval. So that, that would minimize the chance, and maybe if not just outright rule out the chance, right. um, that there would be any issues. Because as long as it's received and then paid for after SED has said yes, that's acceptable, you wouldn't have any issues. What is the, what's the estimated dollar value, Joe? On this particular oh, yeah. item, we were less than five hundred thousand. Oh yeah, two hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we have the incident, the other pieces. So correct. Yeah, it's around the two hundred thousand dollars. So the co-op will let us order this with no. Yeah. So so I'm currently yeah. So I, I'm currently working with uh, through the Omnia Group, which is actually Graybar um, is the rep for it, and they're working with um, the same agency who the basis of design material on the project and actually assisted with the design. Um, so I've had preliminary conversations with them to try to explain the situation that the district is in, of course. Um, and they were going to reach out, of course, to their to their folks to try to understand it. They understand our dilemma and they want to help if of course they can go, you know, through with it. I think probably knowing knowing how it works you're not going to pay for the material until the material arrives, right? So I mean, that's for ships, basically. Understanding that we're 40 weeks away from it actually shipping, there's probably no risk there. There may be some commitments needed on behalf of the district for submittals and just giving them the green light to do it. So it may look like some sort of down payment potentially. Um, just for them to get the ball rolling and, and have that monetary commitment to the actual job, um, but it's it's nothing in lines of you know 200 total. You know, I don't think it's anywhere there. I haven't gone that far down the route yet, um, and and I'm also just so everyone knows I'm also dealing with um, Stark, who is another vendor who who lives in this co-op world, who actually does you know a lot of the HVAC equipment. They also supply electrical equipment. Um, as a double check, of course, of parts and pieces. So, you know, provide the district, you know, the best price, of course. Because the co-op, although it's, it is pre-bid, basically, and on the list of pre-bid items, um, you know, we still want to make sure that we're you know, crossing our teeth on our eyes and getting the best value for the district. So, we checked any applicable state regulations, purchasing requirements, to ensure that this fits in with that. Yeah, so I personally, I personally use it here with 
state search for the turf. I've done it with uh, Trunco for roofing systems. I mean, you, these systems are in place for the district uh, <coughs> to be able, you know, to, to bypass the normal bidding. And again, so this is strictly for material. We would still go through normal operations and bid out the actual electrical labor and the work through the contractors, so the electrical contractor would still actually be responsible for not buying this turnkey. This is strictly just to procure those materials and, and give us an opportunity, a, a fighting chance to actually get this done. But we're not bypassing bidding. We're, nope. It's called a co-op. Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's designed to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're well within our rights for no legal bidding. And we know that SED will approve it. Yes, I mean, this is the package that's okay. part of the project. So I'll continue to do my homework on my end and provide some updates from both groups. Um, and then we'll talk about next steps. Okay. Well, formal action is kind of confirming we're in agreement with that. I would recommend that the board um, accept the proposal to uh, move forward with the procurement of this electrical gear for phase two. Do, we have a, do I have a motion? A motion. I'll second. <laughs> Bring Chris second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks for your tech help. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you yourself? Thank yeah, you used to go. <laughs> <laughs> Consent agenda. I would recommend the board approve the financial non personnel consent agenda items one through four as submitted. Do we have a motion? A motion. All in favor? Aye. Right. I would recommend that the board approve the personnel consent agenda items one uh, through 20 as submitted. Do we have a motion? A motion. Okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. Personnel items, Craig Smith. Not sure who's here. Uh, it's new hire, Shane Rendy. Uh, Mary Beth Mesta. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Uh, let's see, Maureen Quay. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, Sabrina Vasquez LaRose. Okay, no argument, but I didn't say that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, at this point, just real quickly, for our new hires, first and foremost, welcome to Mary Bell. Uh, thank you. We look forward to seeing great things from you. Uh, my name is James McDermott. I'm the current sitting board president. I've been on the board about five and a half years now. Um, I'm Jennifer Polarski. I'm the current vice president of the school board, um, and I've been on the school board for three years. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, Marie Zimmer. Um, this is my first year. I am a retired Maryville teacher, and these two ladies that have their children, they are an <laughs> awesome addition to the Maryville family. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Chris Dew. I've been on the board for a year and a half, and you're know, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I recommend the board approve the memorandum of agreement as presented. Do I have a motion? Second. All favor? Aye. 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 Recommend the board approve the second reading of the policy updates. Do we have a motion? Motion. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Um, EC ASB, Erie County Association, we had our delegate assembly meeting this past week. Chris and I were there. Uh, it was a good meeting. They had a lot of good conversations amongst the different districts. Um, Legislative is Thursday. It is Thursday. Are you going to be able to attend? Uh, yeah, I originally didn't think I was going to be able to, but I am going to attend. Okay, perfect. Uh, and
and then we have the budget and finance the week after, which I am not able to attend. Uh, Marie, I think you're the alternative. Would you like to go? And then what date is that? It's Thursday, October, uh, September 28th. September 28th, Thursday, yes, I can attend it. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. actually do have our executive director sitting in the audience. Dave, Dave, do you have anything to add or say? Uh, other than we have um, a couple of programs coming up. We have a uh, district clerk uh, workshop on October 5th. That information went out. We have a limited number of spots available. So if you're interested in attending, sign up sooner. And the next program that we have is October 12th with Rick Timms. And that is filling up fast also. Uh, and it's a great program. In fact, I'm going to see him uh, at Chautauqua County on Wednesday. Um, similar program, just different facts and figures because there are different districts down there. <coughs> and that'll be at the columns if anyone's interested. Uh, let Sheena know and she can get you registered for that. And then, of course, we still have to discuss uh, school board at the annual meeting in October. Uh, if anybody's interested, we got to get registered. I think uh, early bird is coming soon. Um, I'm not going to be able to get the time off of work to go to the three days. So, but if somebody can, please let us know. Uh, I don't know of any updates with New York State School Board. So, outside of that, election coming up. So, I am all set. President uh, Whitman. Reverend Rick left, so then we before we do adjourn, it dawned on me that for the audit report, we did not take action to officially receive and accept the audit report that was presented. Um, it just wasn't listed separately in that way. <laughs> if we could uh, recommend that the board officially accept the audit report um, that was presented tonight. Thank you. Do we have a motion? A motion. Yes, I All in favor? Aye. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, I need a motion to close the meeting. Motion. All in favor? Aye. Thank you all for coming.